Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's Midday Western U.S. Regional Forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, this map shows us the upper level flow pattern we've seen so far through the month of July. So from July 1st through the 25th, we featured a relatively permanent ridge that's been sitting here in the Gulf of Alaska with troughing that's been sitting here on the border of Alaska and Canada. And as a result, this kind of flow pattern gives us in the upper levels, you know, flow that comes out of the Northwest. And we've seen systems kind of track from the Gulf of Alaska, cutting down here in these forms of these uh, troughs that just keep sneaking into the parts of the Pacific Northwest. The thing about this pattern, though, is that given the way things are shaping up across the eastern part of North America, it has been a pattern that has allowed for the return of monsoonal moisture. And we've been bringing in some storms, but it's been highly localized at how the storms have come into parts of the desert southwest. So the big questions we have as we move forward is there are a few moving pieces. For example, the Madden Julian Oscillation is finally moving. The trade winds are picking up speed. The Southern Oscillation Index is now positive. And what does all that mean? The Central Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean are starting to advertise some change. We're going to have to watch to see if it changes this pattern moving forward. Because up until this point, this is what we've had throughout the month of July in terms of our temperature anomalies. You can see in parts of the Northwest, we've been uh, cool, uh, one to three degrees below average. Whereas much of the rest of the West, especially in parts of California, we've seen near average temperatures with maybe a little bit warmer than average in parts of the Central Valley of California. Now getting down into the desert southwest getting into parts of Arizona and New Mexico we have certainly been well above average in terms of temperatures here and I'll show you exactly how we got there in just a few moments but this is what the departure for normal looks like so far through the month of July. Let's talk about that monsoon a little bit more. Over there on the left, this is uh, just several locations throughout Arizona, and the map on the right shows the percent of average precipitation since the 15th of June. And you can kind of see the very spotty nature of the monsoonal flow, and it's very characteristic to do this in that uh, the heaviest storms tend to line up with the mountains, depending on how the flow does come out of the southwest. But when we compare our actual rainfall amounts to normal, you can see that most locations here are reporting less, in fact, all locations are reporting less than average precipitation. So this mon monsoon has been a bit lackluster, despite the fact that it's really tried to get going. Where we've seen more of the precipitation has been farther east over parts of New Mexico. This map shows you the last 30 days in terms of percent of normal precipitation. And while you can see that parts of Arizona getting into Southern California have got their numbers down here in the zero to 10% range, get up into the northern parts of Arizona and then get over into uh, parts of New Mexico and there have been some locally very, very heavy rainfall. Over the last month too, remember how wet things had been from parts of the Snake River Valley uh, getting up into this part of Montana too, which has made it quite cool there uh, and also uh, much wetter than average. Now in parts of Northern California, <clears throat> Um, Southern Oregon and Nevada, we've seen this. This is a satellite animation from yesterday. Just look at these storms popping on this shortwave that was coming through Northern California. A lot of lightning with these storms, and this is one of the reasons why we're still concerned today with the risk for fires. So just showing you that over the last 24 hours, the amount of lightning that we have seen in the Western United States, uh, the concern here is that a lot of these storms are kind of blowing up on the heat of the day, but they're very high based, and therefore their precipitation doesn't reach the ground. We get a lot of virga, but the lightning still it's the ground and we have the risk for fires. So today, what do we have? We, we do have red flag warnings that are out for parts of Oregon uh, getting into this part of Idaho. We have heat advisories in the parts of the Columbia Basin and then down here in the southwest, uh, part of the, parts of Southern California, Southern Nevada, and getting into Arizona. We do have um, excessive heat warnings. Now, just thinking about how, thing, how hot things have been in the south, uh, I want to show you this. This is for the Phoenix area. I like to show these graphs. This one goes back here to May the 1st and goes through yesterday. And remember, when you look at these, the top line moving across here like this, this would be record highs, record lows, and then here is the average, okay? Now the blue lines that bounce up and down here are the daily high temperatures and low temperatures. You can see that on numerous occasions we have approached or set new record high temperatures over the last uh, couple of months here. But what I want to notice here is that while we have seen some very warm days, it's been the lack of getting cool at night. You see, normally we would see these blue bars come down and touch this line, but it's only done it a few times. We've seen much more um, uh, overnight low temperatures being above average, uh, and that has been a major reason as to why the whole region has been very, very hot. As we look forward in this forecast, you know we saw the red flag warning. Over the next three and a half days, what we can see here is that in parts of central Oregon, getting up into parts of the Columbia Basin, into the Snake River Valley, we have the potential for having wind gusts that at times get between 30 and 40 miles an hour.
And with the thunderstorm uh, outflow that will come from some of these pop-up storms, we can also uh, really get these gusty winds that should there be any fire threat, it'll push it along very, very quickly. And that's because the humidity levels each day this week in the middle of the afternoon are going to be quite low. This map just shows us today, uh, looking at mid-afternoon humidity levels we see in the Columbia Basin, those percentages getting down to the single digits in places. Uh, and then through Central Valley of California, a lot of uh, 10 to uh, maybe upwards of 15% relative humidity. Much drier as you get down into the desert there uh, in Southern California. So this is why we have the risks we have today. Over the next week, we're just going to take a snapshot at precipitation here. Over the next week, uh, we do have the risk over the coming days here of thunderstorm activity in this quarter. We're going to continue to see that. Uh, but then it'll be a trough that digs in or out of the Gulf of Alaska toward British Columbia that could increase precipitation chances later in parts of coastal Oregon and Washington. To show you that thunderstorm threat, I just like looking at these maps. They're flash density maps for later on this afternoon. That would be the map that's over here on the left. This is going to be for tomorrow on Wednesday. And we're just looking for the regions where the models are putting down the most convection, most pop in the atmosphere. So again, we're going to be watching for those drier thunderstorms in parts of Northern California, jumping up on the Sierra Nevada, and then through the mountainous areas of parts of, of Oregon once you get away from the coast. And this stretches into Idaho, Montana, Utah as well. We see the same situation setting up in the day on Wednesday, which is the map that's over there on the right. And just taking a look at Thursday and Friday, uh, the whole pattern shifts a bit farther to the north here. So you can see that if you're in Washington uh, in the Columbia Basin uh, and also like near the Blue uh, Mountains here over in uh, Oregon in the day on um, Friday, uh, Thursday and then Friday, we're going to keep a close eye on the thunderstorms in that vicinity as well. So what it really boils down to is kind of assessing this pattern. So I'm going to play for you what we're going to be seeing in the upper level flow moving through the next 10 days. And this is coming from the operational European model. You see some familiar pieces, but things are a little bit different in this forecast. And let me show you what I'm talking about here. As I take you back, let's get this to the end and take you back. We see that over the next couple of days, we still have this broader southwest flow. See it coming across the northwest with a ridge that's setting up down here over the southern uh, United States or the desert southwest. So the ridge is what's keeping in the heat, but this southwest flow is what's helping to fuel the thunderstorm threat through the middle of the week. Now what we're going to notice is that by the time we get into Thursday and then eventually into Friday, this ridge really elongates and runs straight up north-south right here through Idaho and then into the border of British Columbia and Alberta, while more troughs, as we keep seeing them, come swinging out of uh, the Gulf of Alaska. Now, the issue here is that this flow at this point is very meridional. What I mean by that is this trough digs down, the air goes right back over this ridge and then back into a trough over the east. And when the flow is more north-south, well, naturally, it's not going to move more west to east. So we tend to get stuck in this pattern Friday, look at this, into Saturday and into Sunday. It could last for a few days. While that trough just sits and spins here, we end up getting this ridge barely moving just from what the, the border from, um, you know, British Columbia and Alberta, just over four days to the border of, you know, uh, Alberta and Saskatchewan. While this broad trough develops here in the central part of the United States in the Midwest. So the heat's going to come back on to the west as we progress into the next couple of weeks. So uh, real quick, I would like to talk about precipitation. Unfortunately, this particular pattern is not one that is conducive to getting good flow out of the Southwest and good flow out of both the Gulf of Mexico, out of Mexico, and then out of the um, Southern Pacific. So without that flow pattern, we do see the monsoon backing off a little bit. Now a week ago, when I was looking at this, I didn't see this very well. I'll admit it. I had thought that as we moved into August, we would get a good finish to our monsoon season here. But due to the changes we saw over over the weekend with the pattern getting a bit more amplified with that deeper trough east and the broader ridge west, it's trying to shut this down uh, in both the European and in the GFS ensembles. So that, that's unfortunate, um, and it was a, a, an oversight by me. I, I don't know if I could have picked it up earlier, but I certainly missed it. So what are the temperatures going to do? Well, it's a hot one today. We can see up in the uh, Columbia Basin, temperatures easily getting up to the triple digits through the Central Valley of California, a lot of upper 90s, lower 100s, maybe 101, 102. Getting down into Southern California and Arizona, we're going to be talking about uh, getting up above 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Playing this forward, we're going to see that heat continues into the day tomorrow on Wednesday, almost an identical picture here just maybe a bit more broad heat in the northwest and as we go into Thursday another scorcher here for the Columbia Basin and it gets very very hot uh, down here in the southwest with the San Joaquin Valley ranging between 97 and 105 degrees Fahrenheit as we go into Friday 
and then eventually into Saturday. Remember, this is about the time where the trough was getting closer to British Columbia, so we return back toward normal here. But much of the rest of the Western United States, remember, has that large ridge that's coming up like this that's just going to slowly shift. So watch, this is Saturday into Sunday and Monday. Did you see the warmth just slowly shift a little bit with that shifting ridge? That's all we're going to be seeing. So very warm in the Intermountain West, very warm in the Central Valley of California compared to normal. Uh, but with the trough so close to the Pacific Northwest, we do get a bit of a cool down here. Uh, back toward normal temperatures here, uh, maybe slightly cooler than average in parts of the Pacific Northwest. Now with that heat, let me show you what the total evaporation looks like through the next week. We can see very high evaporation rates with the heat in the Columbia Basin and just to, to the west of the Blue Mountains here. Uh, got kind of getting into the uh, Tri-Cities area and down along the Columbia River itself get into the southwest and we're talking very very high evaporation rates so if there's any surface water it will of course evaporate very quickly but looking beyond this this is now exclusively looking at days six through ten remember when the troughs got closer we got a little bit of a cooler signature but where that ridge sits we can see the high heat is on so that extends from california back over toward the four corner states and then up into the canadian prairies and as we look out here longer term there's a bit of a difference between the gfs and the european model the gfs allows a bit more troughing to come in like this but a broad broader ridge and not such a well-defined trough over the southeast. What happens with the European is it wants to take the ridge and back it up and keep it in the west. So it's pointing over in this direction. That pushes troughs into British Columbia, not the northwest, and that allows a deeper dive of a trough over the southeast. The end result is the European's got a bit more amplified pattern, whereas the GFS has a broader ridge. I'm tending to favor the European at this point, seeing that um, it's it's got this broader ridge extending to the west. I think that's more consistent with the change as we're seeing all around the, the, the globe. And the big one's going to be this one. I'll talk about it tomorrow. Uh, we spent 62 days over here in phase one and a little bit into phase two. And the Man Julian Oscillation is finally coming off of Africa. It's moving over the Indian Ocean, so right in through here, and could get over into the Maritime Continent area, which is where we're talking about being north of um, Australia. And so if it starts to move, this is going to change the way that momentum and moisture is transported out of the tropics, which could have an impact on the Pacific jet stream. But interestingly enough, the European model, which just came out last night with its new weekly model runs for week three and week four, didn't back down much uh, in terms of change. And I think we should focus maybe more on the temperature patterns, but it's it's been very consistent. I told you this is an area I really struggled with. It's been very consistent from August 11th through the 25th with keeping quite a bit of heat in the western part of the United States. Um, and so that uh, seems to be a robust signal here. And I saw it yesterday in the CFS V2 model. And we'll continue to analyze this and report back to you tomorrow with our long-range outlook, okay? So we have a lot, I think, to be paying attention to here and uh, prepare for some, some heat in the western United States. So with that, I'll wrap it up. Hope you have a good rest of your day, and we'll talk to you again very soon. Thanks.